Hello and welcome to what is actually Pirates of the Caribbean, which uh, I mean, not Pirates of the Caribbean, but um, yeah, this is beyond Shakespeare. Um, we read plays from um, <laughs> you know, up to 1642, English plays up to 1642, um, and we basically uh, enjoy everything that is not Shakespeare because, you know, yeah. anyway, there are reasons for that. It's one of the rules of the club, you know, it, I don't make the rules, I just... Yeah, anyway. Uh, so today we're reading um, The Fair Maid of the West or A Maid Worth, go A Girl Worth. Yeah, sorry. Today we're reading <laughs> Fair Maid of the West or A Girl Worth Gold, the first part. And it's written by Thomas Haywood. Um, and it was printed for Richard Royston and was to be sold in his shop at Ivy Lane at 1631. Um, wait, no, I mean, 1631 was the year. Printing. Yeah, yeah. And um, this is going well. Uh, <laughs> so reading this play with me, uh, which we will discover very shortly, why I've made the reference to Pirates of the Caribbean, um, uh, are these lovely people. Um, <laughs> uh, and... Um, yeah, reading uh, the prologue and Bess in this play, we have. Sarah Blake, actor, writer, and director based in Germany. Um, reading, one second, let me check my list because I forgot already who is reading what. Uh, re reading um, Carol Florissett and a sailor three, third sailor, um, sir, and a servant, we have. Alan, melting in soccer. <laughs> Same here, but not in Suffolk. Um, <laughs> reading uh, Goodlack, Captain Goodlack, we have. Lynn Freitas, uh, it's actually still chilly here in the northwestern United States. I am so sorry, jealous. Alan. Um, reading um, Captain Two, Drawer Two, Clem, sail and Sailor Two, and an alderman and the surgeon, a woman of many professions, or a person of many professions. I don't know what pronouns you prefer. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Hi, I'm Emily Snyder. Uh, I am currently in Stratford upon Avon. Woo! So no, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, yeah. We we anyway. Um, <laughs> reading um, Captain Number One, uh, a drawer Number One, a rough man who sounds like a superhero, uh, and Sailor One. We have. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Amisu, and I'm an author based in Essex. And finally, but you know, not, last but not least, um, we have um, reading Spencer, a mayor, and uh, how do you call it? Uh, maid, later on, we have. Brian Sparrow, actor who's going to be probably in a puddle by the end of this. <laughs> Not the good kind. Um, anyway, um, <laughs> good kind of I don't know. I, yeah, maybe there is. I hope. Um, yeah. Anyway, so moving on. I'm I'm Eric Carulla, your host for today, a chaotic host, as you can tell. Um, and without further ado, please bring in the prologue. <laughs> Amongst the Grecians there were annual feasts to which none were invited as chief guests save princes and their wives. Amongst the men no argument could be disputed then but who best governed and as did appear he was esteemed sole sovereign for that year. The queens and ladies argued at that time for virtue and for beauty which was prime. And she had the high honour, two, ere be, for beauty one, the other, majesty. Most worthy, worthy did that custom still persever, not for one year, but to be sovereigns ever. Yeah, that was the prologue. I, I don't know if that tells you very much about the play. Um, it, having read part of it for the purposes of this, um, I can't say that it does. Any thoughts before we move on? Um, Sarah, and then Emily. 
it just, it, it's quite a pretty little prologue, but it seems like it's one of those maybe generic ones that Rob talks about that like gets stuffed on the beginning of a play when they're not quite sure what else to put on there. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Emily. <laughs> oh, just being a complete verse nerd. Um, it's interesting to see that this is rhyming couplets in pentameter uh, rather than tetrameter, which is kind of what I would expect from from this piece. When was this written again? Mm. Do you remember, Eric? Well, it was printed in 1631. It may have been written okay. earlier, um, probably performed earlier as well. I'm, I'm assuming. Um, yeah, but I even so, think. it's actually pretty good rhyme. Um, because it doesn't just repeat itself to get a rhyme on the next line. Um, and it uses in jammed rhyme as well. So, um, it, you know, in terms of just verse structure um, and verse usage, not too bad. In terms of what did I really get from it? Not quite sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it is a sort of that thing. Please sit down. We have a play. Well, you paid money for a play, remember? Um, yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. And anyway, we shall move on <laughs> to the actual play. So act one, scene one, enter two captains and Master Carol. When puts my lord to sleep? When the wind's fair. Resolve, may I entreat. Can you not guess the purpose of this voyage? Most men think the fleet's bound for the islands. Nay, Nay. tis... Nay, tis like the great success at Callis, under the conduct of such a noble general, hath put heart into the English. They're all on fire to purchase from the Spaniard. If their cracks come deeply laden, we shall tug with them for golden spoil. Oh, were it come to that. How Plymouth swells with gallants, how the streets glister with gold. You cannot meet a man but tricked in scarf and feather, that it seems as if the pride of England's gallantry were harboured here. It doth appear, methinks, a very court of soldiers. It doth so. Where shall we dine today? At the next tavern by, there's the best wine. And the best wench. Best bridges. She's the flower of Plymouth Hell. The castle needs no bush. Her beauty draws to them more gallant customers than all the signs in the town else. <laughs> Sweet lass, if I have any judgment. Now, in troth, I think she's honest. Honest and live there? What, in a public tavern? Where such a confluence of brave and lusty gallants? Honest, said you? I vow she is, for me. <laughs> for all, I think. I'm sure she's wondrous modest. But within, with all, exceeding affable. An argument that she's not proud. No, were she proud, she'd fall. Well, she's a most attractive adamant. Her very beauty hath upheld that house and gained her master much. Mm, that adamant first shall for this time draw me too. We'll dine there. No better motion. Come to the castle then. And thus endeth the scene. I'm just wondering if I should run it into the next one because I want to find out what happens next. <laughs> Yeah. So enter Master Spencer, which, which this is, has been sort of denoted as Act 1, Scene 2A, um, because it's connected to the next scene as well. Uh, enter Mont Master Spencer and Captain Goodluck. What? To the old house still? Can't blame me, Captain. Believe me, I was never surprised till now or catched upon the sudden. Pray, resolve me. Why, being a gentleman of fortune's means and well-revenued, will you adventure thus a doubtful voyage when only such as I, born to no other fortunes than my sword, should seek abroad for pillage? Pillage, Captain? No. Tis for honour and the brave society of all these shining gallants that attend the great Lord General drew me hither first. No hope of gain or spoil. Aye, but what draws you to this house? As if thou knewest it not. What? Bess, 
Well, even she. Come, I must tell you, you forget yourself. One of your birth and breeding, thus to dote upon a tanner's daughter. Why, her father sold hides in Somersetshire and being trade fallen, sent her to service. Prithee, speak no more. Thou tellst me that which I would fain forget, or wish I had not known. If thou would humor me, tell me she's fair and honest. Yes, and loves you. To forget that we were to exclude the rest, all saving that were nothing. Come, let's enter. Enter two drawers. You are welcome, gentlemen. Show them into the next room there. Look out a towel and some rolls, assault and trenchers. No, sir, we will not dine. I am sure you would if you had it my stomach. What wine drink ye, Sacre Claret? Where's Bess? Mary, above, with three or four gentlemen. Go call her. I'll draw you a cup of the neatest wine in Plymouth. I'll taste none of your drawing. Go call Bess. There's nothing in the mouths of these gallants, but Bess, Bess. <laughs> what say, sir? Nothing, sir, but I'll go and call her presently. Tell her who's here. The devil rid her of the house for me. Out of the house Sorry, for me. Sir. Nothing but a nom, a nom, sir. Enter, indeed, Bess Bridges. See, she's come. Sweet Mr. Spencer, you are a stranger grown. Where have you been these three days? The last night I sat up late at game. Here, take this bag and lay it up till I call for it. Sir, I shall. Bring me some wine. I know your taste and I shall please your palate. <laughs> Troth, tis a pretty soul. To thee I will unbosom all my thoughts. Were her low birth but equal with her beauty, here would I fix my thoughts. You are not mad, sir. You say you love her. Never question that. Then put her to it. Win opportunity. She's the best bod if you, as they say, if as they you say she loves you, she can deny you nothing. I have proved her unto the utmost test, examined her even to a modest force, but all in vain. She'll laugh, confer, keep company, discourse, and something more, kiss. But beyond that compass, she no way can be drawn. Tis a virtue but seldom found in power. Enter indeed best with wine. Presumably she exited too. Oh, tis the best of the grave's wine, sir. For mercy, sir, girl, come sit. Pardon, sir, I dare not. <laughs> I'll have it so. My fellows love me not, and will complain of such a saucy boldness. Pox on your fellows. I'll try whether their pottle pots or heads be harder if I do but hear them grumble. Sit now, Bess. Drink to me. To your good voyage. Uh, did you call, sir? Yes, sir. To have your absence, Captain is up. Let it come, sir. Must you be set and we wage with a... What say you, sir? Uh, no, 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 I come there. And the drawer exits. What will you venture best to see with me? What I love best, my heart, for I could wish I had been born to equal you in fortune, or you so low to have been ranked with me. I could have then presumed boldly to say, I love none but my Spencer. Bess, I thank thee. Keep still that hundred pound till my return from the islands with my lord. If never, wench, take it, it is thine own. Find me to you. Enter the first drawer again. Yes, you must fill some wine into the portcullis. The gentleman there will drink none but of your drawing. She shall not rise, sir. Go, let your master snick up. And that should be a cousin German to the hiccup. Enter the second drawer. 
Bess, you must needs come. The gentlemen fling pots, pottles, drawers, and all downstairs. The whole house is in an uproar. Great pardon, sir. I needs must be gone. The gentlemen swear if she will not come up to them, they will come down to her. If they come in peace, like civil gentlemen, they may be welcome. If otherwise, let them usurp their pleasures. We stand prepared for both. Enter Carol and two captains. Dave, you gallants, you are somewhat bold to press into your company, may be held scarce manners, therefore fit that we should crave your pardon. Sirs, you are welcome. So are your friends. Some wine. Pray give me leave to fill it. You shall not stir. So, please you, we'll join company. Draw more stalls. I take it she's a she-drawer. Are you of the house? I am, sir. In what place? I draw. Fear, do you not? You are some tapstress. Sir, the worst character you can bestow upon the maid is to draw wine. She would draw none to us. Perhaps she keeps a run but for your taste, which none but you must pierce. I pray be civil. I know not, gentlemen, what your intents be, nor do I fear or care. This is my room, and if you and if you bear you, as you seem in show, like gentlemen, sit and be sociable. We will. Thinks, by your leave, remove, I say. She shall not stir. How, sir? No, sir. Could you outface the devil? We do not fear your roaring. Though you may be companion with a drudge, it's not fit she should have place by us. About your business, housewife. She is worthy. The place as the best here, She and she shall keep it. You lie! And they bustle, and Carol is slain. The gentleman is slain away! Oh, heaven, what have you done? Undone thyself and me too. Come away. Oh, sad misfortune. I shall lose him ever. What, are you men or milksops? Stand you still, senseless as stones, and see your friend in danger to expire his last? Tush, all our helps in vain. This is the fruit of whores. This mischief came through thee. It grew first from your incivility. Lend me a hand to lift his body hence. It was a fatal business. Exit the captains. I'm sorry, I'm just scanning ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, we'll pause here for a second, uh, sort of ruminate on what's just happened. Um, so one person is dead already. I mean, that was quick. Uh, they just went, yes, we'll fight over her. You shouldn't be here. Die. <laughs> That escalated quickly. I know, right? Yeah. And all this for Bess, who, I mean, yeah, just, yeah, I mean, Sarah's worth dying for, but I mean, that's not, uh, maybe in a oh, different really? context. <laughs> um, <laughs> any thoughts? <laughs> well, we've seen a play before. She's not really a Tanner's daughter, right? I mean, that's my guess. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Uh, maybe she is. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I I like all this sort of, I'm trying to, because obviously we're doing this on Zoom, so uh, I'm trying to picture how this would work, like sort of she's sitting next to Spencer or in his lap or something, and he's kind of like, it's kind of a tug of war with her in the middle, maybe? I'm, I'm guessing, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's just, you know, that's my right. imagination. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> any any thoughts on this, uh, on either the physical shenanigans or the death shenanigans or anything else? Um, Emily, <laughs> I can see you pondering. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess my question is, because I, I didn't have a chance to read all this, um, whether Spencer's good or not. Um, because I was reading it it very much as you know black hat white hat in terms of spencer particularly saying hey the money's yours if i don't come back and sort of defending her honor and her right to work which is kind of cool um which i liked 
so I don't, I don't know. It sounds like sit by me rather than on me. Yeah. Do you know, it doesn't. And, and the fact that Bess herself is, is, it seems to be, and I don't know, Sarah, if you're feeling this, um, but like, I wish we were the same station. Like, so I guess that's my curiosity for those playing Spencer and Bess is sort of what were you feeling in terms of your relationship? Yeah. Uh, sorry, Lynn, Bryony, Sarah. Yeah. Oh, I, 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 my tendency is to let Sarah respond as the person who is reading that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then Sarah, Bryony. <laughs> yeah. Um, I. Yes, I, I mean, I don't, I, I don't want to commit myself because usually when I do, it all goes pear-shaped. Um, but it feels genuine. It, it like, it, it, it doesn't, I, I, I wasn't feeling like she was a, you know, a, a saucy wench and he was a bit of a ne'er-do-well who was like, oh, I love you, but he's, he's, he's going to swagger off to the next tavern. It felt quite genuine and authentic. Um, and he really did seem to be, um, you know, sort of honouring her in, in, in quite a sweet way. Um, and um, like, yeah, he seemed to be sort of genuinely um, respectful of her. But I mean, <laughs> I mean, the number of times I've thought, oh, yay. We, we we have we have like uh you know some female autonomy here and a man who's a bit of an ally as well as a romantic leader and then it all goes pear shape so I, <laughs> I i i i i don't want to really say um i will just say though i thought that that fight scene and that death was actually really um i i really liked the way it was done because it just felt really um it had a bit of bathos to it and it got it it's sort of like real scenes that you get in um bars you know where you get these kind of random tragedies that occur just because two blokes have had a bit of wine and are not a bit Being of wine, bit, bit of bit of beer and usually but yeah um yeah and and exactly and there's a bit of alpha male strutting going on and it just gets out of hand almost like accidentally and before you know it somebody's um yeah Punched an eardrum, or has been stabbed, or it has had their life ruined, or indeed ended in some way. And um, I, I just thought it was kind of quite. It was very. It was a quick shift. It did escalate really quickly, but these things do. And I just thought it was actually quite well um, observed. Yes, I just realized I was muted. I was. I was totally agreeing there, and it's like, <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, what I find interesting is that Carol goes, you lie! And then it's like, but uh, I mean, yeah, there's kind of no no explanation for that, no context for that statement, but I mean, maybe it's just me. Um, Brian. Maybe, perhaps I'm, I'm jaded from my 17 years of bar work and <laughs> putting far too modern eyes on this, but personally, I found that I, I thought I feel like there is something a little bit unsavory there. I feel like she's having to manage these men very carefully. Um, and I think she's aware of the stakes that, that can be involved. I don't know. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm just not 100% that it's genuine. I think, I, I still think Spencer might be a bit of a creepy girl. I don't know. Like I say, it could, it could be me putting my, my modern eyes onto this situation and that's why I'm, not liking it and seeing the unsavouriness. It, it might be a perfectly normal, early modern relationship as normal as whatever that is. I don't know. This is true. This is true. Um, well, I promised Lynn she'd speak then yeah. Elizabeth, yeah. then Alan. Yeah. So, mm. yes, in, in, in response back to, to Emily's meditation on who's the, who are the white hats and who are the, the black hats, structurally and generically we are introduced to Spencer where we would be expecting to 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 meet the male lead and we know that he's well born and has an independent income and he's not in it for pillage he's in it for honor so it has all the earmarks of he's the lead he's the male lead he's the gallant um or, yeah el galan as they say in in Spanish, he's the he's he's the hero, um, and we find out that his relationship with Bess has is so far technically honorable. So 
yeah, the expectation is that he's the good guy. Um, and again, as I said, you know, generically, we don't expect a Tanner's daughter to really turn out to be a Tanner's daughter if a gentleman is interested in her and says he loves her. Um, but, but yeah, the fact that the uh, a fatal encounter has taken place on such slight provocation is is then structurally really weird or a little bit a little bit weird. And we haven't established that Carol is an asshole, and we don't care if he's dead. You know. Usually we would establish that character as someone we don't like. So when Spencer kills him, we kind of feel like, well, he kind of had it coming. But they did, the play didn't take time to do that. Yeah, it's been very quick, sort of very... Um, it, well, it's kind of a throwaway character, isn't it? Sort of, eh, doesn't matter, moving yeah. on. <laughs> uh, yeah, but then they try to pick up the body as well and move him away, which is handy. I mean, it's nice to have uh, be in a room full of <laughs> strong men and captains and all that stuff. We're going to move bodies for you. Um, I mean, just saying, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I think I said, <laughs> okay, Sarah, and then Elizabeth, then Emily, then Alan, and I've lost track. No, uh, it was Elizabeth and then Alan first. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Elizabeth, Alan, Emily, then Sarah, then we should move on. I just wanted to say so briefly, check out Bess Bridges. You know, she is one of those characters that's like before she comes on stage, she's talking about her. She's the, the most beautiful wench in all the world. No, she's terrible. She's awesome. She's and then I was thinking, oh, no, this isn't going to live up to expectations. But she really does. I thought she's a really fantastic character. She kind of like leaps off the page. And there's this line she has. The captain, second captain says, oh, this is the fruit of whores. This mischief came through thee. And she says, no, it grew first from your incivility. And I just was like, pull, woo, go best. You know, like she's speaking back. That's exactly what I would want, you know, a character to say. And I've, I like that she has a lot of agency and she has a lot of sort of not necessarily interiority, but she's, I feel like maybe we've been lacking strong female characters lately. We've done with, you know, I think we've, we've recently done like Fulgens and Lucrece and we've done like Patient Grisel and I've just been like, oh, sick of these wet women. They're so wet and damp. And it's just like, give us some fire, give us some fire in their bellies. And I was just like, okay, Bess is so far my favorite character. Yep. Yeah. I think I said Alan, then Emily, then Sarah again, then we move on. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's already been set up in the scene before Bess appeared that she's actually the major selling point of that pub. You know, this pub needs no bush because it's got <laughs> Bess as the, as the prime attraction. <laughs> yep emily uh <laughs> thoughts i mean you had thoughts so yeah uh yeah no and and uh i will just say absolutely uh regarding best being uh having so much agency it being set so well up uh sort of ooh, who is she who is she one of the things that surprised me as well in terms of the structure thus far two things one is I expected uh, the captains to be in that first scene and then gone. I expected the drawers to be there for like a second just to be like, hmm, she is that away and then gone. And what I'm surprised to see is a much more solid setup of these are people, these are characters, they have points of view. Even if you're captain two or drawer this or whatever, they are distinct from each other um, they're not just there as person who shows up and then, you know, j just to be a non-playing character uh, type thing. And that's so unusual um, in almost any play, really, you know, but particularly of this time when what I was expecting was, okay, you know, two, two people come on and say, what's the deal? <laughs> and that's it. Uh, so bravo to the playwright for um, for actually investing in character and so early on and on unnamed characters too. Yeah, that's nice, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and he's quite, I mean, this is Haywood. We've read him like doing Helen sort of going, yeah, uh, you can choose now. Do I choose Paris or do I choose sort of, um, th this is when one of the plays, you can find it on our YouTube, um, the Age of Iron plays, uh, part two, possibly. Yeah, I think it's part two. Um, God, uh, yes, uh, so many places, so, many, so little time. Um, that where, you know, she had to make the choice between Paris and Menelaus, and it's kind of like, well, fight breaks out, we don't actually know. Um, 
So yeah, we have he has sort of experience doing this kind of thing, uh, which is nice. Um, so Sarah, and then we move on. Yes, I I just I just remembered something after I said, oh well, the um, the relationship between them seems quite authentic and and sweet and respectful. I then remembered something that I that I'd read. Um, not that I'd read out loud, but but I read in one of Spencer's lines, and I just wanted to go back to it um, because of what Bryony was saying, um, because he does actually have a really dodgy speech. He says, I have proved her unto the utmost test, examined her even to a modest force, but all in vain. And when I was reading that, I did think, oh, wh look, mm, what? Um, She'll laugh, confer, keep company discourse and sometime something more kiss, but beyond that compass, no way can she be drawn. And that actually is quite creepy. A again, to a modern, uh, it's probably not meant to be to an early modern audience, but but to a, a, a modern audience, that, 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 that speech did make my ears prick up slightly. I was like, what, hello, what's going on here? Um, but then interestingly, I think at, at that point she had appeared or maybe she had appeared, but only she'd only just come in and gone out again. And I think the reason why I was then like, oh, they seem to have a really authentic relationship is because once she came in she, and they, they, they kind of had a proper dialogue, she was actually holding her own. And that ties into what Elizabeth was saying. And I, so I think it's really the, the dynamic between them or at least the vibe that I'm getting off it at this stage, and um, it's probably all gonna go to hell, but uh, the vibe I'm getting off them at this stage, it's not so much caused by him, it's caused by her. And and as Elizabeth was saying, her, her agency, she seems to, um, she treat, even though she says, oh, I wish we were equals, um, she says that, and yet she is treating him as an equal all the time she's saying it which is kind of interesting even though she says oh we're not equals it's such a shame she's the way she talks to him is as an equal and there is an equity between them or at least there seems to be um and i'm going to shut up now because probably this will all be proved wrong we shall see um let's go forage for more data um <laughs> as rob would say or gather more data i think um, act one scene to be enter the two drawers one call my master, another fetch the constable. Here's a man killed in the room. How? A man killed, says thou? Is all paid? How fell they out? Can't tell. Sure about this bold betris. Tis not so much for the death of a man, but how shall we come by our reckoning? And the drawers exit. Oh, what shall become of me? Of all last creatures, the most infortunate, my innocence hath been the cause of blood, and I am now purpled with murder, though not within compass of the law's severe censure, but which most adds unto my affliction. I by this have lost so worthy and approved a friend whom to redeem from exile, I would give all that's without and in me. Your name's Bess Bridges. An unfortunate maid, known by that name too well in Plymouth here. Your business, sir, with me? Know you this ring? I do. It is my Spencer's. I know with all you are, you are his trusty friend, to whom he would commit it. But speak. How fair is he? Is he in freedom, know ye? He's an else of body, though in mind somewhat perplexed. This late mischief happened. Is he fled and freed from danger? Neither. By this token, he lovingly commends him to you, Bess. I praise you. When tis dark, meet him on the hoe, near to the new made fort, where I'll attend you, before he flies to take a kind farewell. There's only good lack in his company. He entreats you not to fail him. Then from me I'll come. I'll run. I'll fly. Stand death before me, or I sure to die. And they exit. Uh, I'm just not sure whether I should run this into the next scene because I really want to find out what happens. I mean, I know what happens next, but yeah. Um, Lynn, yeah. I just want to point out that 
it just it really tickled me that the drawers are like a dead guy well did he pay his tab first well, yeah that's important <laughs> i mean you know you don't want the debt to sort of linger do you who's gonna pay for it yeah, later like, like they drank all this beer and then they and then he died it's like <laughs> yeah I mean, yeah it's like yeah if i so worked just, in a bar i'd yeah. probably have the same attitude it's like oh man blood on the floor i gotta clean that up look this but, happens every saturday night you lose yeah, more yeah. money because of fights than you yeah. do <laughs> you leave yeah. a credit card at the bar because we'll close his tab out now if he's dead yeah i mean that's <laughs> why <laughs> in america yeah. they just hold your credit card if you <laughs> die we could keep charging you <laughs> Yes, this is this is exactly. Hope we around to contest the charges. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I just like sort of Bess's lines were, "I'll come, I'll run, I'll fly." Yeah, just sort of you know. So we love. Point. Yeah. It's well, that mushy. that that points towards more sincerity, does it, Sarah? Yeah, well, on her part, yeah, but yeah. yeah. I, I I would say so on her part at least. I mean, with jury still out on him, but I think she's. <laughs> She seems really to be quite a genuine person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, true. Well, I want to go find out what's going to happen next. So I am just going to uh, speed this up a bit. And act one, scene three, enter Spencer and good luck. You are too full of passion. Canst thou blame me to have the guilt of murder burden me? And next, my life in hazard to a death so ignominious, last to lose a love so sweet, so fair, so amorous, and so chaste. And all these at an instant, I, art thou sure, Carol is dead? I can believe no less. You hit him in a very speeding place. Oh, but the last of these sits nearest my heart. Sir, be advised by me. Try her before you trust her. She perchance may take the advantage of your hopeful fortunes. And when she finds you subject to distress and casualty, her flattering love may die. Your deceased hopes. Thou counselest well. I'll put her to the test and utmost trial before I trust her father. Here she comes. Enter indeed forest, uh, for, forset or forest and Bess with a bag. I've done my message, sir. We're not, sweet Spencer. We are now alone, and thou art sanctuaried in these mine arms. While these confer, we'll sentinel their safety. Uh, this place I'll guard. Aye, uh, this one. Are you not hurt? Or your skin raised with his offensive steel? How is it with you? Best. All my afflictions are that I must leave thee. Thou knowest withal, my extreme necessity and the fear of a most scandalous death doth force me hence. I am not near my I am not near my country, and to say to stay for new supply from thence might deeply engage me to desperate hazard. Is it quite you are? Here is the hundred pounds you gave me. Then. Use that. Beside what I have stored and saved, which makes it fifty more. Were it ten thousand, nay, a whole million, Spencer, or were thy? No, what thou hast, keep still. It is all thine own. Here be my keys. My trunks take to thy charge. Such gold fit for transportage as I have. I'll bear along. The rest are freely thine. Money, apparel, and what else thou find'st, perhaps worth my bequest and thy receiving, I make thee mistress of. For I doubt it, but now you strive to have me ecstasied. What would you have me do in which to express my zeal to you? Which in my chamber hangs my picture, I enjoin thee to keep ever, for when thou partest with that, thou losest me. My soul may from my body be divorced, but never that from me. I have a house in Foy, a tavern called the Windmill, that I freely give thee to, and thither, if I live, I'll send to thee. So soon as I have cast my reckonings up and made even with my master, I'll not fail to visit Foy in Cornwall. Is there else aught that you would enjoin me? 
thou art fair. Join to thy beauty virtue. Many suitors I know will tempt thee. Beauty's a shrewd bait. But unto that, if thou add'st chastity, thou shalt overcome all scandal. Time calls hence. We now must part. Oh, that I had the power to make time lame, to stay the stars, or make the moon stand still. But that future day might never haste thy flight. I could dwell here forever in thine arms, and wish it always night. We trifle hours. Farewell. Oh, first, take this ring. It was the first token of my constant love that passed betwixt us. When I see this next, and not my Spencer, I shall think thee dead. For till death part thy body from thy soul, I know thou wilt not part with it. Swear for me, Bess, thou mayest safely do it. Once more, farewell. At foy thou shalt hear from me. There is not a word that hath a parting sound, which through mine ears shrills not immediate death. I shall not live to lose thee. Best be gone, for hark, I hear some tread. A thousand farewells are in one contracted. Captain, away. Exit, Spencer, and good luck. I shall die. What means you, Bess? Will you betray your friend? Or call my name in question? Sweet, look up. Oh, is my Spencer gone? The speed towards Foy. Let it take ship the file. Let me recollect myself, and what he left in charge, virtue and chastity, next with all sudden expedition, prepare for Foy. All these will I conserve, and keep them strictly, as I would my life. Plymouth, farewell. In Cornwall I will prove a second fortune, and forever mourn, until I see my Spencer's safe return. Presumably she exits and is going on tour. Well, no, not on tour, but I mean, she's going to Cornwall uh, to to, um, to a pub. Oh, well, to own her own pub. Um, or I'm confused, but I mean, maybe I'm just always confused. Um, any thoughts on this, uh, this sequence? Um, Sarah, then, then, and then, yeah. It's, it's ironic that you're confused because I actually corpsed in the middle of that scene just because she said, I'll not fail to visit Foy in Cornwall. <laughs> it's like, let's just slide a bit of exposition there. Like, you know, where's Foy? It's in Cornwall, folks. <laughs> it just seemed like a really daft thing to add into the sentence. But I guess for people who don't know that Foy, Foy is a, um, a coastal town in Cornwall. And I assume she's he's he he owns a a pub or a mill. It was a wind. The wind pub's name is the windmill. Oh, the pub's name is the oh, that's it. Okay, so she's going to to look after the windmill for him in his absence. I guess I think that's yeah. what's happening. Yeah, yeah. See, this is why I have you people to explain what happens because I can't. I can't. No, I mean I I follow it, but then it's like, hey, yeah, my knowledge of geography is about as early modern as the play. Um, <laughs> any thoughts? Well, um, yeah. So we've got, we've got take my picture, keep it all, keep it forever. Here's this ring, keep it all. And if I if I see it as and not on your hand, I'll know you're dead. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> so we we kind of know there's going to be so some confusion she loses track of the picture and he thinks she's he's been betrayed and he loses the ring and she thinks he's dead but it'll all work out in the end we hope yeah I, i'm curious to see if these predictions work out um emily then alan uh just uh, on the theme of bess being a badass um <laughs> it is pretty remarkable that were pointed in the direction of what will happen to Bess um, as she takes over. We don't really have a sense of, I mean, Spence just keeps kind of trying to leave. Oh, I can't stay because I'm going somewhere. Oh, I can't stay because now I've killed someone. Um, <laughs> you know, and uh, and I guess I feel like just in early modern, you, you so get set up for 
in you know for the woman to be like oh i shall wait for you i shall wait around as opposed to great i'm gonna go off and run a business um <laughs> and uh, i i just think that's amazing my sole question if i were dramaturging this <laughs> you know in real time would be you didn't show us that that these two actually have a love relationship um so so we're taking a lot on faith that they are very much romantically intertwined and we should care uh <laughs> you know although our actors are doing fantastic job of believability in such a little time well to be fair i mean uh, there there is I, I think the only reason we kind of don't believe it is that we're going fast and uh, sort of very 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 quickly as well uh yeah. i meant to say just real quick as well it is fascinating to me to see that this is not poetic language by and large. You had um, the sanctuary of these my arms, which was beautiful. Um, but this is really prosaic language, um, which I just didn't expect. Uh, and which maybe that's why it's in Cornwall is funny because it's just so like, we're not even going to try to soften it. It's just, here's the info, like all through this entire thing. Here's what's going on. You can follow it fairly easily. Well, she does read like a romantic heroine though. It's like, I, I will love you. I stay, I fly, whatever. And all that stuff is, it sounds yeah. very romantic, but also no. we know that she's low born. Uh, we were told in the first scene that she's low born. And like, if, if her status were equal with her beauty and all that stuff. So it's but kind no of like- But no one's we're not using dealing. like a lot of illusions, yeah. metaphor, alliteration. You're not using poetic devices that much. Um, and I'm just, that's just interesting and curious. And I wanted to note it. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. Um, Alan. Then... Yeah, I mean, I, I think what we're getting set up, although it's not been explicit, is that Spencer is actually a, a minor landowner, sort of squire yeah. level of society, um, you know, who, who's picked up this um, rather nice looking wench in a, a pub, a bleak body house. I am curious to see if your predictions are correct. I Okay, we should run this into Act 1, Scene 4, and then uh, run like Act 2 together, because I think Act 2 is actually quite a bit longer and you know might need squishing together for a time. <laughs> a technical term there, squishing together. Anyway, um, Act 1, Scene 4. Um, I don't know how to pronounce this word, so please forgive me. Oh, boy. Uh, Oh, boys, uh, a dumb show. Enter general, captains, the mayor, petitioners the other way with papers. Amongst these, the drawers. The general gives them bags of money. All go off, saving the two drawers. Tis well yet we have gotten all the money due to my master. It is the commonest thing that can be for these captains to score and to score. But when the scores are to be paid, non est inventus. Tis ordinary amongst gallants nowadays who would rather swear 40 oaths than only this one oath, God, let me never be trusted. But if the captains would follow the noble mind of the general, before night there would not be one score owing in Plymouth. Little knows best that my master hath gotten these desperate debts, but she hath cast up her accounts and is gone. Whither canst thou tell? they say, to keep a tavern in Foy, and that Mr. Spencer hath given her a stock to set up for herself. Well, howsoever, I am glad, though he killed the man. We have got our money. And thus ends Act 1, which is great, because we tied up all the loose ends, you know, the, the tours got paid, everyone got paid, um, and they left. So now we, we are now relocating somewhere else for act two i'm just wondering if we should yeah no we shouldn't pause here we should just keep going act two um scene one enter Forsett and ruffman in your time have you seen a sweeter creature some week or thereabouts and in that small time she hath almost undone all the other taverns gallants make no rendezvous now but at the windmill Bite of them i'll have her it shall cost me the setting on but I'll have her. Why, do you think she's so easily won? Easily or not, I'll bid as fair and far as any man within 20 miles of my head, but I will put her to the squeak. They say there are night sons already come as suitors to her. 
there's like enough, some younger brothers, and so I intend to make them. If these doings hold, she will grow rich in a short time. There shall be doings that shall make this windmill my grand seat, my mansion, my palace, and my Constantinople. Enter Best Bridges like a mistress and Clem. Here she comes. Observe how modestly she bears herself. I must know of what burden this vessel is. I shall not bear with her till she bear with me. Until then, I cannot report her for a woman of good carriage. No master that dwelt here before my coming hath turned over your years to me. Right, forsooth. Uh, before he was a vinter, he was a shoemaker, and left two or three turnovers more besides myself. How long hast thou to serve? Uh, but eleven years, next grass, and then I am in hope of my freedom, for by that time I shall be at full age. How old art thou now? Forsooth, newly come into my teens. I have scraped trenchers this two years, and the next vintage I hope to be a bar boy. What's thy name? My name is Clem. My father was a baker, and by the report of his neighbors, as honest a man as ever lived by bread. And where dwelt he? Below here, in the next crooked street, at the sign of the leg. He was nothing so tall as I, but a wee, but a little wee man, and somewhat huckbacked. He was once constable. He was, indeed. And in that one year of his reign, I have heard them say, he bolted and sifted out more businesses than others in that office in many years before him. How long is it since he died? Mary, the last dear year. For when corn grew to be at high rate, my father never doed after. I think I have heard of him. Then I am sure you have heard he was an honest neighbor and one that never loved to be meal-mouthed. Well, Sarah, Prove an honest servant, and you shall find me your good mistress. What company is in the mermaid? Uh, there be four sea captains. I believe they be little better than pirates, so they be so flush of their ruddocks. No matter. We will take no note of them. Here they may vent many brave commodities by which some gain accrues. They're my good customers, and still return me profit. What you what, mistress? How the two sailors would have served me that called for the pound and a half of cheese. How was it, Clem? When I brought them a reckoning, they would have had to me to have scored it up. They took me for a simple gull, indeed, that would have had me to have taken chalk for cheese. Well, go wait upon the captains. See them want no wine. No reckoning neither, take my word, mistress. She's now at leisure, I'll to her. Lady, what gentlemen are those above? Sir, they are such as pleased to be my guests, and they are kindly welcome. Give me their names. You may go search the church, but where they were christened. There, perhaps, you may learn them. Minion, how? Fie, fie, you're too rude with this fair creature. No way seeks to offend you. Free. Hands off! I tell thee, maid, wife, or whate'er thou beest, no man shall enter here but by my leave. Come, let's be more familiar. Last, good man! Why, knowest thou whom thou slightest? I am Ruffman, the only approved gallant of these parts, a man of whom the roar is standing awe, and must not be put off. I never yet heard man so praise himself, but proved in the end a coward. Coward, Bess, you will offend me, raising me that fury your beauty cannot calm. Go to, no more. Your language is too harsh and peremptory. Pray, let me hear no more on it. I tell thee that quiet days, skies past, near these seven years, I have not cracked a weapon in some fray. And will you remove and will you move my spleen? What? Threat a woman? Sir. If you thus persist to wrong my house, disturb my guests, and nightly domineer to put my friends from patience, I'll complain and right myself before the magistrate. Can we not live in compass of the law, but must be swaggered out, aunt? Go to, wench. I wish thee well. Think on it. 
there's good for thee stored in my breast. And when I come in place, I must have no man to offend mine eye. My love can brook no rivals. For this time I am content your captain shall have peace, but must not be used to it. Sir, if you come like other free and civil gentlemen, you're welcome. Otherwise, my doors are barred you. That's my good girl. I have fortunes laid up for thee. What I have, command it as thine own. Go to, be wise. Well, I shall study for it. Consider on it. Farewell. And he exits, presumably, Ruffman and Forsyth exit. My mind suggests me that this prating fellow is some notorious coward. If he persist, I have a trick to try what metals in him. Enter Clem. What news with you? I am now going to carry the captain's a reckoning. And what's the sum? No, let me see. Eight shillings and a sixpence. How can you make that good? Write them a bill. I'll watch them for that. Tis no time of night to use our bills. The gentlemen are no dwarves, and with one word of my mouth, I can tell them what it is to be tall. How comes it to so much? In premise, six quarts of wine at seven pence the quart, seven sixpences. Why dost thou reckon it so? Because, as they came in by Hapnab, so I will bring them in a reckoning at sixes and sevens. <laughs> well, wine, three shillings, sixpence. And what wants that of ten groats? Just tuppence over. Then put sixpence more to it and make it four shillings wine, though you bait it them in their meat. Why so, I prithee? Because of the old proverb, what they want in meat, let them take out and drink. <laughs> then for twelve penny worth of anchovies, eighteen pence. How can that be? Marry, very well, mistress. Twelve pence anchovies and sixpence oil and vinegar. Say they shall have a saucy reckoning. And what for the other half crown? Bread, beer, salt, napkins, trencher, one thing with another. So the sum of totalis is eight shillings and sixpence. Well, take the reckoning from the bar. What needs that forsooth? The gentlemen seem to be high flown already. Send them in but another bottle of sack and they will cast up the reckoning of themselves. Yes, all about it. Exit Clem. Cry not with so my suit is pestered, I might enjoy my spencer. What a sweet contented life were this, for money flows and my gains great. But to my roughman next, I have a trick to try what spirits in him. It shall be my next business in this passion, for my dear spencer, I propose me this. Amongst many sorrows, some mirths not amiss. And she exits. <laughs> I kind of want to run this on, but I also just want to pause here with like all the shenanigans that Clem is up to. Just like, yeah, well, you know, we can charge them a bit more. Is, is that what's going on? Or is that just me sort of misunderstanding the exchange? Oh, um, no, Emily definitely. And, this is the master yeah. of the house. <laughs> <laughs> this this yeah. little, you know, what, 13 year old kid is knows how to run yeah. a business. <laughs> It's, well, he's been there forever. I get the impression that at the time it was prodigiously clever because there's punning going on as well as as mathematics that you have to keep in your head if you're going to follow it. And he makes this, that, that thing about chalk and cheese. That's a joke because, you know, it, that's a, a, a British expression, right? It's like chalk and cheese. They sound alike, yeah. but they're not at all alike. And the reckoning was probably brought to them on a little chalkboard because paper was really expensive. It wasn't a tab on, on paper. It was it, it was probably on a wax tablet or a little chalkboard. Um, for, and the, the, the customer would look at that and say, looks right, pay you cash. So, I mean, I think there's all kinds of punning and clever stuff going on that it's just, it's lost now. Sorry, but I bet it was—I bet it was hilarious at the time. <laughs> yeah, probably. Uh, Alan. Actually, it felt extremely current, apart from the fact that they. Oh well, there's a fifteen percent voluntary service charge we've added to the bill. Knock it <laughs> off if you don't want to pay us. <laughs> yeah, the bit I didn't get was the whole um, 
high flown part they seem to be high flown already as in like you know they won't tell the difference between being sort of like if you charge them too much they won't know is that the whole bit the high whole flown thing? as in as a newt yeah 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 i got that part but then it's like send them in another bottle bottle of sack and then they'll cast up the rest and you know they're just like sort sort it out because then they won't oh mind. yeah overcharging for this for that if you get them even drunker we can get more Yay. And, and also there's a bodily function joke in there because to cast means to vomit. So the, yeah, there's just all kinds of multiple meanings and jokes and stuff going yeah. on. Any thoughts on Bess? Because yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you have a new, new thoughts. That you you want to like, revise uh, sort of. Yeah. No, be, like Elizabeth said, she's got a little, she's, she's got a little spunk. She's just, that line about, yeah, anybody who praises himself that much turns out to be a coward in the end. <laughs> and she's just like, yeah, this guy's kind of a pain in the ass. And I think I'm going to prank him just to prank him because to entertain myself. You know? Yeah. So, you know, I'm kind of sad. So I'm going to prank this guy to keep myself entertained, cheer myself up. Mm -hmm. I love it. I, I just love how ordinary she is. Um, I, there's, um, there was some uh, talk earlier on, you know, is she going to turn out to be, uh, you know, a prince's daughter? Maybe, maybe she still will, I don't know. But I just love the fact that she's so ordinary. Um, she's just a good, like, savvy, honest, spirited working woman. Yeah. I don't often see that in these plays um there's nothing dramatic about her um she's a good you know she's a good kind honest person uh but she's not high flown she's not noble she's not given to fantastic stretches of poetry um she's just getting on with it she's very relieved that she finds herself in this situation where she is able to make money and be her own mistress and she's not at all um you know backward in talking about that because it's important to her obviously that she survives but she still loves her Spencer um and that is all perfectly in balance with her she's a very she seems to be a very balanced and a character who is really integrated within herself and I am loving that about yeah. her um it's just it's it's rare that we find it in early modern plays and here it is yep uh, Lynn has thoughts and then we should move on. Yeah, her little exchange with with Clem and they, Clem makes a, a joke about, oh yeah, my master was a shoemaker before he was a tavern keeper. And I, and I wonder how literal that is. So, I mean, this is how I would like it to turn out that um, rather than we find out, oh, Bess actually was adopted by the Tanner, she's really son of the daughter of a knight or daughter of a minor of minor gentry or something like that. Um, we find out that Spencer is kind of pretending to be a gentleman when really he's he's just a guy. That he's commonality with with um, aspirations. So rather than she's actually up at his level, he's actually turns out he was born to her level that so that that it's important in early modern drama that love matches be social equivalents or, or close to it. So um, I, I just think that would be kind of cool if it turns out that they are social equivalents and they're ordinary people and, and, we, and, we're, and we're making a play about them and we care about them. I just, that would be really cool. Yeah, it would be. We should move on to find out. Uh, act two, scene two. And I'm told that this is set in Fail, or uh, I'm hoping that's the right pronunciation, in the Azores, the island. Uh, enter Spencer and good luck. What are you thinking, sir? Trove of the world, what any man should see in to be in love with it. The reason of your meditation? To imagine that in the same instant that one fourth is all his estate, another enters upon a rich possession. As one goes to the church to be married, another is hurried to the gallows to be hanged. The last having no feeling of the first man's joy, nor the first of the last man's misery. At the same time that one lies tortured upon the rack, 
another lies tumbling with his mistress, over head and ears in down and feathers. This, when I truly consider, I cannot but wonder why any fortune should make a man exorcist. <laughs> you give yourself too much to melancholy. These are my maxims, and were they as faithfully practised by others as truly apprehended by me, we should have less oppression and more charity. Enter the two captains that were before. Make good thy words. I say thou hast injured me. Tell me wherein. When we assaulted Fayal, and I had, by the general's command, the onset, and with the danger of my person, enforced the Spaniard to a swift retreat, and beat them from their fort. Thou, when thou <coughs> sawst, all fear and danger past, made step with me, to share that honor which was soul mine own, and never ventured shot for it, or e'er came where the bullet grazed. See, Captain, afraid towards, let's, if we can, atone this difference content i'll prove it with my sword that thou though thou hadst the foremost place in field and i the second yet my company was equal in the entry of the fort my sword was that day drawn as soon as thine and that poor honor which i won that day was but my merit wrong me palpably and justify the same you shall not fight why sir who made you first a justicia and taught you that word shall. You are no general, or if you be, pray show us your commission. Sir, you have no commission but my counsel, and that I'll show you freely. Tis some chaplain. I do not like this text. Let's beat their weapons down. I'll aim at him that offers to divide us. Pox of these part phrase. See, I am wounded by beating down my weapon. How fares my friend? You sought for blood, and gentlemen, you have it. Let mine appease you. I am hurt to death. My rage converts to pity that this gentleman shall suffer for his goodness. Noble friend, I will revenge thy death. He is no friend that murmurs such a thought. O oh, gentlemen, I killed a man in Plymouth, and by you am slain in file. Carol fell by me. And I fall by a Spencer. Heaven is just, and I will not suffer murder unrevenged. Heaven pardon me, as I forgive you both. Shift for yourselves away. Ye saw him die, but grieve you sh should so perish. Note heaven's justice, and henceforth make that use on't. I shall faint. Short farewells now must serve, if thou survivest. Live to thine honour, but if thou expirest, heaven take thy soul to mercy. And the captain's exit. I bleed much. I must go seek a surgeon. Sir, how cheer you? Like one that's bound upon a new adventure to the other world. Yet, thus much, worthy friend, let me entreat you, since I understand the fleet is bound for England. Take your occasion to ship yourself, and when you come to Foy, kindly commend me to my dearest Bess. Thou shalt receive a will, in which I have possessed her of five hundred pounds a year. A oh, noble oh. legacy. The rest I have bestowed amongst my friends, only reserving a bare hundred pounds to see me honestly and well interred. I shall perform your trust as carefully as to my father, breathe he. Mark me, Captain. Her legacy I give thee with this proviso. If at, the, at thy arrival, where my best remains, thou finds her well reported, free from scandal, my will stands firm. But if thou hearest her branded for loose behaviour or in modest life, what she should have, I here bestow on thee. It is thine own. But as thou lovest thy soul, deal faithfully betwixt my best and me. Else let me die a This ring was hers. That, be she loose or chaste, bring her own, restore her. She will know it, and doubtless she deserves it. Oh, my memory. What had I quite forgot? She hath my picture. And what of that? If she be ranked among the loose and lewd, take it away. 
I hold it to, I hold it much indecent. A horse should have it in keeping, but if constant, let her enjoy it. This my will perform, as thou art just and honest. Sense else forsake me. Now lead me to my chamber. All's made even, my peace with earth and my atone with heaven. And they exit, which can't possibly go wrong. You entrust the, all your life's fortune before you actually die to your best, well, best friend, well, captain person. Um, nothing can go wrong, of course. Um, I mean, yeah. And yeah. Spencer is basically fighting from the moment he's on stage. He's fighting against um, you know, captains and Carol and stuff, and it's then fighting because he got into... It's unclear why he starts to fight here, but I, I think it's maybe just me missing stuff. Um, um, Lynn. Yeah, the two captains are in a tiff about something, and he tries to intervene, beat their weapons down. You take your sword and try to... Uh, um, yeah. There's two swords, these guys are fighting. You come from this angle and try to, to part them. So he is injured trying to stop a fight. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll... It's <clears throat> in the last scene, Spencer had exited previously yep. to go abroad. Mm -hmm. And good luck was in um, Cornwall trying it on with Bess. And yet suddenly they're in the same place. There obviously wasn't much continuity work done on this script. Was he? Or was that Forrest? That was Ruffman with, and Forrest was Oh, I helping. beg your pardon, yes. Yeah. I beg your pardon. So I don't, yeah. Um, yeah, Ruffman Sorry, is I just got confused. <laughs> well, they're both fighty, though, aren't they? They're kind of like, oh, yes, I... But also, um, yeah, so for, for now, it's kind of like, yeah, we can leave... Um, Spencer out, out of action for a bit till he gets his costume changed or whatever. Um, <laughs> I, I did like the line, else let me die a prodigy as opposed to, you know, a prodigal sort of person. Um, Elizabeth, are you waving or are you sort of pondering stuff? I'm pondering, but um, I think it's just interesting what Alan said, because Alan was talking about like this kind of like displacement of like place and time that we have in this. And I think that despite the fact that maybe what Alan was saying was not entirely correct, I, I, I agreed with his sentiment that we're moving around a lot in this play and it's almost hard to keep up with where we are and who we're with because we're swapping characters quite a lot. When we're with Bess, I feel like we have some sort of firm foundation of like, okay, so Bess has gone to Foy, she's gone to the windmill, the tavern, to be the landlady there. So wherever we're with Bess, we kind of know where we are. But when we're with the captains, when we're with a Ruffman, Ruffman's with Bess at the moment, but when we're with the captains and with the drawers, it's a bit like, okay, where are we? Yeah, it's kind of like we went from drawers in um, Plymouth to sort of gossip in Cornwall and then uh, went from Cornwall to fail and then, um, yeah. So, cool. Uh, not cool, but I mean, yeah, that's what's going on. That's <laughs> right, <laughs> uh, if I'm not mistaken. And now in the next scene, we're going back to Cornwall because we're uh, meeting Bess uh, again. Um, yeah, so we should probably move on because we might be a bit behind. Um, act two, scene three enter Bess Bridges, like a dressed like a page with the sword and Clem. I know my mother to be chased, I'd swear some soldier got me. It may be many a soldier's buff jerkin came out of your father's tan vat. Thinks I have a manly spirit in me in this man's habit. Now, am not I of many mind, men's minds, for if you should do me wrong, I should not kill you, though I took you pissing against a wall. Methinks I could be valiant on the sudden and meet a man in the field. I could do all that I heard, have heard discoursed of Mary Ambry or Westminster's long Meg. What Mary Ambry was, I cannot tell, but unless you were taller, 
you will come short of Long Meg. Of all thy fellows, thee I only trust and charge thee to be secret. I am bound in my indentures to keep my master's secrets. And should I find a man in bed with you, I would not tell. Be gone, sir. But no words, as you esteem my favor. But mistress, I could wish you to look to your long scenes. Fights are dangerous. But am I not in a sweet taking, thank you? I prithee why? Why, if you should swagger and kill anybody, I, being a vinter, should be called to the bar. Exit Clem. Let none condemn me of immodesty, because I try the courage of a man, who, on my soul's a coward, beats my servants, cuffs them, and, as they pass by him, kicks my maids, nay, domineers over me, making himself lord o'er my house and household. Yesternight, I heard him make appointment on some business to pass alone this way. I'll venture fair, but I will try what's in him. Enter on cue, Ruffman and Forsett. Sir, I can no further. Weighty business calls me away. Why, at your pleasure then. Yet I could wish that ere I pass this field, that I might, I could meet some Hector, so your eyes might witness what myself have oft repeated, namely, that I'm valiant. Sure, no doubt, but now I'm in haste. Farewell. How many times brave words bear out a man, for if he can but make a noise he's feared, to talk a phrase, although he ne'er had the heart to face a man in field, that's a brave fellow. I have been valiant. I must needs confess, in street and tavern, where there have been men ready to part the fray, but for the fields, they are too cold to fight in. You are a villain, a coward, and you lie. You wrong me, I protest. Sweet, courteous gentleman, I never did you wrong. Wilt thou, wilt tell me that? Draw forth thy coward sword and suddenly, or, as I am a man, I'll run thee through and leave thee dead in the field. Oh no. Have we been stuck in place now? Uh, I believe so. Um, okay. Uh, quick thinking, quick thinking. Uh, <laughs> Emily, can you jump in for Ruffman for a sec? Um, hold as you are a gentleman. Hold as you are a gentleman. I have taken an oath. I will not fight today. Thou took a blow already, and the lie. Will not both these enrage thee? So would you give the bastinado too? I will not break mine oath. Ho, oh, I, your name's Ruffman. No day doth pass you, but you hurt or kill. Is this out of your calendar? I. You are deceived. I ne'er drew sword in anger, I protest, unless it were upon some poor, weak fellow that ne'er wore steel about him. Throw your sword. Here, sweet young sir, but as you are a gentleman, do not impair mine honor. Toy that shoe. I shall, sir. And trust that point? Anything this day to save my nose. Enough. Yet not enough, lie down till I stride o'er thee. Sweet sir, anything. Rise, thou hast leave. Now, Ruffman, thou art blessed this day, thy life is saved. I look to the rest. Take back thy sword. Oh, you are generous. Honour me so much as let me know to whom I owe my life. I am Best Bridges' brother. Still me thought you were something like her. And I have heard you domineer and revel in her house, control her servants and abuse her guests, which, if I ever shall hereafter hear, thou art but a dead man. She never told me of a brother living, but you have power to sway me. But for I see you are a gentleman, I am content this once to let you pass, but... If I find you fall into relapse, the second's far more dangerous. I shall fear it. Sir, 
Will you take the wine? I am for London. And for these two terms, cannot make return. But if you see my sister, you may say I was in health. <laughs> Too well. The devil take you. Pray use her well. And at my coming back, I'll ask for your acquaintance. Now, farewell. Exit Bess, I'm guessing. None saw it. He's gone for London. I am unhurt. Then who shall publish this disgrace abroad? One man's no slander should he speak his worst. My tongue's as loud as his, but in this country, both of more fame and credit. Should we contest, I can outface the proudest. This is then my comfort, Ruffman, thou art still the same. For a disgrace not seen is held in no shame. And uh, he exits and to pick up the pace a bit, we're going to run act two, scene four uh, in, into the previous scene. So enter two sailors. Sailor one, act, uh, yeah, the board, the board, that's where we're at. Would that be Elizabeth then, do you want me to do Sailor I'm one? I'm Sailor one. Yeah, oh, no, I'm Sailor one. Yeah, sorry. Yep. Act two, four. scene four, page yeah. 26. Act two, scene four. Aboard, aboard, the wind stands fair for England. The ships have all weighed anchor. A stiff gale blows from the shore. And um, they exit. I can't. Yeah, and no, enter, enter Captain Goodlack, sorry. Uh, the sailors call aboard and I am forced to leave my friend now at the point of death and cannot close his eyes. Here is the will. Now may I find yon Tanner's daughter turned unchaste or wanton. I shall gain by it 500 pounds a year. Here is good evidence. Sir, will you take the longboat and aboard? With all and my heart. Sir, third sailor. What, are you ready, mates? We stayed for you. Thou canst not tell who's dead. The great bell rung out now. They say it was for one Spencer, who this night died of a mortal wound. My worthy friend, unhappy man that cannot stay behind to do his last rites. What's his name, Spencer? Yes, sir. Gentleman of good account, well known in the Navy. This is the end of all mortality. It will be news unpleasing to his best. I cannot fare amiss, but long to see whether these lands belong to her or me. And with a sneaky chuckle, uh, he exits. I, I imagine it's a chuckle, I don't know. Uh, moving on into Act 2, Scene 5, back in... Back in uh, fail uh, enter spencer and his surgeon and nay fear not sir now you have escaped this dressing my life for yours i thank thee honest friend uh, sir i can tell you news what is i prithee there is a gentleman one of your name that died within this hour my name what was he of what sickness did he die? No sickness, but a slight hurt of the body, which showed at first no danger but being searched. He died at the third dressing. At my third search, I am in hope of life. The heavens are merciful. Sir, doubt not your recovery. That hundred pound I had prepared to expend upon mine own expected funeral, I for namesake will now bestow on this. A noble resolution. What ships are bound for England? I would gladly venture to see, though weak. All bound that way are under sail already. Here's no security, for when the beaten Spaniards shall return, they'll spoil whom they can find. We have a ship, of which I am surgeon, that belongs unto a London merchant now bound for Mamora. A, a town in Barbary. Please you, to use that. You shall commend free passage ten months hence. We hope to visit England. Friend, I thank thee. I'll bring you to the master who I know 
we'll entertain you gladly. When I have seen the funeral rites performed to the dead body of my countrymen and kinsmen, I will take your courteous offer. England, no doubt, will hear news of my death. How best will take it is to me unknown. On her behaviour, I will build my fate. There, raise my love, or thence erect my hate. They exit, um, which is nice. Um, to wrap up scene, uh, act, not scene two, yeah, wrap up act two, um, which is, um, yeah, interesting, isn't it? What just <laughs> a twist. Uh, you kill your namesake, but hey, you're uh, well. At least that's what I think happened because it seems to be that one of them was because he, he was defend. He was breaking up the fight earlier, and then sort of the one who got injured was as well as himself was Spencer, um, or not? Because he does mention mm -hmm. Spen uh, another Spencer mm -hmm. at some point, or is that just me, mm -hmm. um, Alan? Yeah, I think it's just heavily heavy coincidence, as luck and the plot would have it. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. It's uh, any thoughts on on the Ruffman best scene, uh, oh. which um, uh, Elizabeth missed because it cut out. Lynn, and then uh, then Emily. Oh, it is <laughs> that escalated quickly. This it, like this is like everything's happening so quickly. I mean, like the first plot point, Spencer kills someone in anger and has to flee the country, and then. Um, as soon as Bess gets settled in her new job, she's being kind of harassed by this, this braggart, she decides to take him down a peg, and then we're going to have, like, her get false news of her enamorata's <laughs> like, Oh, everything's happening so quickly. But, um, yeah, that scene where she's dressed up as a guy, that's just so interesting. When she puts on a man's clothes, and of course the actor would have been a young man, I'm um, saying, like, now that I'm dressed like a guy, I could act like a guy. I could start fights. I could, I could beat some people up. Um, and and the fact that that yeah, Ruffman just really rolls right over. Ah, I, I, yes, I am the submissive dog. I'm the beta dog. You know, <laughs> don't hurt me. And uh, I am Best Bridges' brother. <laughs> it was hilarious. I loved it. Yeah, it's it's a great scene. Um, uh, I know I said Emily, but I think I'll go to to uh, Sarah, then Emily, then Bryony. Okay, thank you. Um, I I love this scene because she is not getting into men's clothing because she's in some dire scrape and needs to, you know, find her way through the world and get back to her husband slash boyfriend slash father slash whatever patriarchy she comes from um i she's just doing this of her own volition because she wants to teach him a lesson he is a rowdy annoying abusive customer she knows he's a coward and so she undertakes to do this partly to sort him out on on terms that he will understand without any fear um, she decides she's more than capable of sorting him out. So she does it on herself. She doesn't ask anyone else to do it. She does it herself. And also she does it a, a certain amount, as she said at the end of the previous scene, for devilment, because she thinks it's going to be funny. And she likes a joke and it does turn out to be funny. And all that business with her getting him to tie her shoe and, um, you know, undo her her points or whatever, I, it's just hilarious. So I I, I really... This is not a sort of normal britches scene. Um, and I just really love it. I, I, we've talked before already about her agency. I'm just loving it. And I'm loving her humor. And I'm loving the fact that it's so ordinary. Um, a bit like what I said about the fight scene right at the beginning um, of the play. This, these characters, they're so, um, well, at least the ones in the West Country anyway, they are so everyday and, um, just familiar like we, we know we know who these people are even though they are to a certain extent you know stereotypes maybe we we recognize them they're the people that we 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 know from you know down our local pub maybe so uh yeah it's just just i loved it yeah it's it's also fun because like she just you can tell she's enjoying it <laughs> yeah 
Um, I think I was, it was Briny then Emily or Emily then Briny, one of the two. I'm confused now. Okay, okay, Emily. Or you. <laughs> I don't know um, what days. It's all good. It was, uh, yeah, it was lovely to play that that scene. I agree. It's not your usual um, Bridges role scene um, because it's not, it's interesting because it's not for hiding. It's for purpose. Um, it's not a, I'm doing this and we'll see what happens. Um, it's, I have a very cunning plan, <laughs> uh, which is all the end. And I'll put it on when I need it. I'll take it off when I need it. Um, it was, of course, loads of fun to play. And what's also lovely is, of course, all this throughout this play, we're seeing so much interior stage direction um, so that you're not invited as an actor to just stand and deliver. Uh, you're very much forced by the text to, to have some lovely farcical elements, which is great. Um, just want to speak briefly as the uh, structure is unfolding. Uh, yes. I think Lynn said that it's going so fast. And one of the things that I'm delighting in is as much as I know act structure, I am not guessing every twist and turn. And yet every twist and turn that's happening is absolutely inevitable from the characters as they've been set up thus far. Uh, so I'm having fun just rolling with the punches here. Um, and lastly for right now as a verse thing, particularly playing Clem, what's delightful to, or interesting to see while um, paragraph form does not always have to, you know, be for, uh, you know, common classes, although, of course, we know that is, um, is sometimes typical. I mean, Spencer, though, has a paragraph form speech, which is fascinating. Clem is all in paragraph form. And what was really interesting, and I don't know if this was the editor or if the writer actually wrote it this way, is that Clem will speak in paragraph and then Bess will reply in verse, uh, which is just fascinating to see. And I think it, it tells you something about their relationship. And yet then Bess will be able to go straight into paragraph form as well. So she is code switching uh, easily, which is an interesting hint to the actor, even if the audience is not hearing any difference, because you're not switching from highly poetical verse language to highly prosaic paragraph form. Um, the style is staying the same, but there are hints in the text, which are just very interesting. Yeah, it's it, well, also just because Clem like is not the sort of silly servant. He's kind of like, you know, um, if you I, kill someone, I'll have to go to the bar and not always at the bar he works at, Clem, but also the bar. I, if Clem is right on that balance of is he a fool or is he a clown? You know, because you've got the the wit of the fool, but but there's something I don't know, just a little bit. I find a fool tends to be a little bit here, um, in terms of you know status, and a clown tends to be like I am good in the muck, and uh, yeah, there's an interesting balance happening there for this character. Yep, and Brian, you had some thoughts on on the well. What we've done so I don't have that much to add, just yeah, absolutely in love with Bess, not just because I'm reading Spencer. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, totally not, not biased, totally not biased. Um, yeah, if there are no other thoughts, we should move on and uh, we're going to run the next two scenes together so we can uh, tidy them up a bit. Um, and Act 3, Scene 1, enter Ruffman, who is going to be read by Lynn for now because um, Elizabeth had disappeared. Uh, and force it. I are well met, just as I prophesied, so it fell out. Just how, I pray? Had you but stayed the crossing of one field, you had been beheld a Hector, the boldest Trojan that ever Ruffman met with. Pray, what was he? You talk of little Davy, cutting dick, and diverse such, but tush, this hath no fellow. What stature and years was he? Indeed, I must confess he was no giant, nor above fifty, but he did bestir him, was here and there and everywhere at once, that I never so much put to it since the midwife first wrapped my head in linen. Let's to Bess. I'll tell her the whole project. Yes, the house. We'll enter, if you please. Where be these drawer rascals? I should rat jars, rascals, I should say, that will give me no attendance. Enter Clem. Anon, anon, sir, please, you see a room. Oh, what? 
You here again? Now we shall have such roaring. You, Sarah, call your mistress. Yes, sir. I know it is my duty to call her mistress. See, and the slave will stir. Yes, I do stir. Shall we have humors, saucebox? You have cars. I'll teach you prick song. But you now have a wrong sow by the ear. I will call her. Do, sir, you had best. If you were 20 roughmans, if you lug me by the ears again, I'll draw. Why, what will you draw? The best wine in the house for your worship, and who I would call her, but I can assure you that she is neither, she is either not stirring, or else not in case. How not in case? I think she hath not her smock on, for I saw it lie at her bed's head. What drawers grow capricious? Help! Help! Enter best bridges to save the day. How's this? Shall we never be rid, be rid for, of these disturbances? Why, how now, Bess? Is this your housewifery? When you are mine, I'll have you rise as early as the lark. Look to the bar yourself. These lazy rascals will bring your state behind hand. You lie, sir. How lie? Yes, sir. At the Raven in the High Street. I was at your lodging this morning for a bottle pot. You will, uh, about your business, must you here stand gaping and idle? And Ruffman strikes Clem. Me, sir, and tyrannize too much over my servants. I will have no man touch them but myself. If I do not put ratsbane into his wine instead of sugar, say I am no true baker. And at Clem exits. <clears throat> what? Rise at noon? A man may fight a tall fray in the morning? And one of your best friends too be hacked and mangled and almost cut to pieces and you fast close in your and you fast close in your bed ne'er dreamt on it for you this day and ne'er was better put to it in my days i pray i was thus as i passed young fields enter the kitchen maid I pray forsooth, what shall I reckon for the jowl of Ling in the portcullis? A pox upon your jowls, you kitchen stuff. Go scour your skillets, pots and dripping pans, and not interrupt us. And Ruffman kicks the maid. The devil take your ox heels, you foul cod's head. Must you be kicking? Minion, dare you scold? Yes, sir, and lay my ladle over your cock's cone. And she exits. Do not say that thou darest strike a man that swaggerest thus over women. How now, Bess? Shall we never be quiet? You are too rude. Now I profess all patience. Then proceed. Rising up early, Minion, whilst you slept, to cross yon field, I had but newly parted with this my friend, but then I soon espied a gallant fellow and most strongly armed. In the midfield we met, and both being resolute, we jostled for the wall. There stand a wall in the midfield. I meant strove for the way. Two such brave spirits meeting, straight both drew. The maid, forsooth, sent me to know whether you would have the shoulder of mutton roasted or sod. Mischief on your shoulders. And Ruffman strikes him again. That's the way to make me never prove good porter. Still he wrongs on wrongs. I was in fury to think upon the violence of that fight and could not stay my rage. Once more proceed. Had you seen two tilting meteors jostle in a mid-region, with like fear and fury we two encountered, no Briarius could with his hundred hands have struck more thick blows, came about my head. I took them still, thrust by my side, twixt body and my arms, yet still I put them by. They were past he put them by. Go on. But in this fury, what became of him? I think I paid him home. He soundly mauled. I bosomed him at every second thrust. Skate he with thine. 
Aye, that's my fear. If you recover this, I'll never trust my sword more. Why fly you not if he be in such danger? Because a witch once told me I ne'er should die for murder. I believe thee. But tell me, pray, was not this gallant fellow a pretty fair young youth about my years? Even thereabout. He was not fifty then? Much of my stature? Much about your pitch. He was no giant then. And wore a suit like this? I have suspect. That gallant fellow, so wounded and so mangled, was myself. You base white livered slave. It was this shoe that thou stooped to untie. Untrust those points, and, like a beastly coward, lay along till I strid over thee. Speak, was not so? It, it cannot be denied. Hair-hearted fellow. Hi, milksop. Dost not blush? Give me that rapier. I will make thee swear thou shalt redeem this scorn thou hast incurred. Or, in this woman's shape, I'll cudgel thee and beat thee through the streets. As I am best, I'll do it. Hold, hold. I swear. Dare not to enter at my door till then. Shame confounds me quite. That shame redeem, perhaps, will do thee grace. I love the valiant, but despise the base. Will you be kicked, sir? She hath wakened me and kindled that dead fire of courage in me, which all this while has slept, to spare my flesh and wound my fame. What is it? I will not rest till by some valiant deed I have made good all my disgrace past. I'll cross the street and strike the next brave fellow that I meet. I'm bound to see the end on it. Are you, sir? And Ruffman beats <laughs> off Forsyth. Um, anyway, <laughs> Act 3, Scene 2. <laughs> Enter the mayor of Foy, an alderman, and the servant. Believe me, sir, she bears herself so well, no man can justly blame her. And I wonder, being a single woman as she is, and living in a house of such resort, she is no more distasted. The best gentleman, the country, yeah, the county yield, country yields, becomes her daily guests. Sure, sir, I think she's rich. Thus much I know. Would I could buy her state, were it for a brace of thousands. <laughs> a shot somewhere. Mm. Twas said a ship is now put into harbour. No wench she is. I'll bring news from the quay. Servant exits. To tell you true, sir, I could wish a match betwixt her and mine own and only son, and stretch my purse too upon that condition. Please, you. I'll motion it. Re-enter the servant. One of the ships is new come from the islands. Greatest man of note from Captain Goodlack. Tis but a small vessel. Enter Goodlack and sailors. I'll meet you straight at the windmill. Not one word of my name. <clears throat> oh, that was Elizabeth, first sailor. Mm. Oh, okay, one sec. Give me a minute. Um, we understand you. Sir, it is told us you came late from the islands. I did so. <clears throat> Pray, sir, the news from thence. The best is that the, is that the general is in health and file one from the Spaniards, but the fleet, by reasons of so many dangerous tempests, extremely weather-beaten. You, sir, I take it, are mayor of the town? I am the king's lieutenant. I have some letters of import from one, a gentleman of very good account, that uh, died late in the island to a maid that keeps a tavern here. Her name, Bess Bridges. The same. I was desired to make inquiry what fame she bears and what report she's of. Now, you, sir, being here chief magistrate, can best resolve me. 
To our understanding, she's without stain or blemish, well reputed, and by her modesty and fair demeanour hath won the love of all. Yeah, the worst for me. <laughs> I can assure you. Many narrow eyes have looked on her and her condition, but those that with the most envy have endeavoured to entrap her have returned, won by her virtues. So all that I inquire of make report. I am glad to hear it, sir. But I have now some business. I, of course, must leave you. I entreat you to sup with me tonight. Oh, sir, I may trouble you. Exit the mayor and alderman. Five hundred pound a year out of my way. Is there no flaw that I can tax her with to forfeit this revenue? If she is, is she such a saint? None can missay her. Why, then I myself will undertake it. If in her demeanor I can find but one blemish, stain, or spot, it is five pound, five hundred pound a year. Well got. And that's where we're ending for today. He asked. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Um, Elizabeth just, uh, sorry, no, Elizabeth. Today's one of those days. Um, Emily just put in the chat, uh, go on, try to get the better of Bess. I dare you. And I, th <laughs> I, I mean, I think you're right. Just kind of, you know, uh, maybe. But yeah, I, I, I'm enjoying this. Um, um, any, any, any thoughts on, <laughs> well, yeah, Lynn. Yeah, Emily was saying something earlier about the, the, the characters. And Elizabeth said, you know, Bess from the, her very first scene really seems to to pop off the page and, and I think you could do something interesting with good luck like maybe he really is sort of a decent kind of he's a guy's guy he's always hung out with guys um you know he's a bro and you know and he kind of means to to do what Spencer asks him to do but just the idea of like 500 pounds a year I could finally just live on my own and not have to be a sailor 500 pounds a year 500 pounds a, and he's sort of gradually is corrupted um and decides no i'm gonna get this money i'm gonna i'm i'm, I'm gonna do what it takes to 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 get this money so it doesn't start out as a bad guy but he starts he's he's kind of he's morally weak and is is seduced by the 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 temptation of that kind of income so we'll see if like in the end he's like yeah i did it i'm sorry um or if or if not um but yeah, I think he could be a really interesting character that we don't necessarily have to hate and be sort of shallow and one dimensional. So yeah, some just like interesting acting opportunities here. A lot of interesting acting opportunities. Um, Alan and Sarah. Yeah, I mean, one, the whole pace of the thing is remarkably quick. I mean, mm -hmm. on stage, people be popping in and out like there's no tomorrow because while we've had, I think about 10 scenes in total, if that, in terms of what's marked in the script, there's probably 20 units of action because of the numerous exits and entrances and yeah. groups where, where if I were doing the setup and looking at it right, it's a new scene each time the stage is empty, you would have considerably more. But looking at this 500 pound a year thing, I think that reinforces my assertion earlier of um, Spencer actually being squirearchy rather than he may own the pub, he may be landlord of the pub in terms of owner of the land, but I don't think he's an active taverner. Yeah, no, he sounds like someone who's been sa sailing a lot rather than, and saving a mm. lot rather than actual. Uh, or you know, like, he's money. probably he's probably outsourced the job to Clem totally. Yeah. Um, <laughs> No, based on <laughs> under, under supervision probably yeah and there was also a question of um earlier which i think you raised in the chat eric about father never doed more and yeah. i i read that in the context of yeah when when the price of grain shot through the roof father yeah. never actually made dough or bread again yeah yeah, definitely. But it was also a, an acoustic pun because of deer and doe and mm. doe and deer. Oh, and yeah. Things. I mean, there's a lot of word games and pronunciation issues that are being played with throughout this. And I think a lot of it, if it was done in a West Country um, dialect, 
would probably work very, very well. Mm -hmm. And Sarah, <laughs> how have you been enjoying? I mean, we can sort of start with final thoughts if you want and stuff, because, you know, we, we are running out of time, but also. Um, well, my final thought is I love this and I, I don't really have anything more analytical to say at this point. I'm just really enjoying it. I did just want to flag up something though about Spencer, which maybe is obvious to everyone else, but I it wasn't obvious to me till I thought of it. So then I wanted to flag it up um, for the dear viewers at home. Um, this, this incredibly convenient um, plot device that has occurred, this amazing coincidence where um, Spencer happens to have been um, you know, in the Azores at the same time that another person called Spencer has also been wounded but has died from his wounds. Um, this is actually, um, this is quite interesting what this does because um, it would be very, very tempting for Spencer, given the situation he's in, he's had to flee uh, Britain because he's murdered somebody. So therefore, if he goes back, there will be a price on his head. You know, if, if he is caught, he will be hung um, or tried and then hung. Um, however, um, he's, he's just been landed with this huge, marvelously coincidental opportunity whereby another guy called Spencer, very similar to him, has, has, has died. It would be so easy for him to take that guy's identity and to use it to go back to the UK and start his life over. And he does mm -hmm. not do that. He does not choose to do that. Instead, he says, oh, wow, he didn't survive, poor guy. I did. You know what? This hundred quid I was going to spend on my funeral, I'm going to take back to his family because that seems like a good and honest thing to do. Now, I, I, I can't think of any other situation where that's happened in a play. Like, normally what would happen is he'd go oh my God, this is such a stroke of luck. I'm going to go back to the UK and assume this guy's identity. And the fact that he doesn't do that, um, but clearly that's probably what's going to happen. But it, rather than him, him being, it, it being about him, oh, I'm going to take on this guy's identity and scheme, it's probably going to be the family going to go, oh, bless you, we will adopt you in the place of our dead son because you have been so kind to us. It's like that is that is literally virtue rewarded. That is him making a choice in that moment about what he's going to do with this opportunity and not use it for his own selfish ends. He, his first thought is one of altruism and uh, compassion, not of what can I get out of this situation for myself. And I just thought that was a really interesting um Mm -hmm. Okay, it's a little bit clunky with it being this massive coincidence, but it sets up a really interesting character choice um, that he makes. And maybe that was just really obvious, but I, I just suddenly occurred to me and I thought, oh, yeah, I like this because it, we weren't quite sure about um, Spencer to begin with. But, you know, his actions here are actually, um, but he hasn't really done a lot other than get into fights. Uh, but in this moment, he makes a choice and he makes a really interesting choice. Um, choice so in a way that kind of makes him uh, a good uh, a worthy I should say match the best in, yeah. in that moment even if we weren't sure about it before in that moment he kind of comes through um, I, I, I love Clem um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I love that relationship between Clem and Bess it seems to be it's funny but it also seems quite tender um, I, I just again it feels really real um, and I'm just yeah, super enjoying it. I hope it doesn't. I hope it doesn't suffer from the curse of the final act. And oh, we haven't got to the final act yet. But I hope it doesn't all go pear shaped in the final act because I, I really love this play and I really love her. Uh, to be fair, I, I do. I just like how she defends um, sort of her servants from Ruffman sort of going, yeah, you know, only I can beat my servants. You can't beat them. This is my job. The, as sort of, um, you know. Uh, although obviously she doesn't, but um, yeah. And um, Bryony had a th was waving earlier. Um, yeah. Yeah, just I really agree with a lot of what Sarah said. Unfortunately, I my brain went rather than than enjoying the moment of of his goodness like Sarah did. My brain went straight to the gaslighty potential in the future that this has this situation <laughs> has presented because I think he could well. 
still turn up and and because it is early modern normal like just test her a bit more like he's already tested us um so we, yeah that that's already there so i'm i'm prepared for a bit of that but yeah i'm really loving it and there's some great relationships there's some wonderful wonderfully drawn characters and i think the pace is just incredible as well because it's just this breakneck speed where like with the, the ridiculous coincidence of some other guy called Spencer dying from similar things on the same day in the same place that kind of you just have to accept it because it's we're, we're already it's happening it's happened get over it like there's so much suspension of belief but because of the fun I'm happy to do that because I want to know where what's going to happen next Unfortunately, we have to wait another 24 hours. But hey, you can see it in the next video um, yeah. when, when, when it comes, when, I mean, when we, when we actually record the next video, which for you is no time at all, I hope. Um, yeah, it's, it's just interesting how um, there is that sort of undertone of, uh, but I'm guessing also that thing of, um, you know, okay, Spencer has been set up as the good guy. And now we have Ruffman as the bad guy, but he promises, you know, uh, I swear I won't hit anybody else and so on and so forth. But then decides to sort of um, beat up force it for no apparent reason. <laughs> um, yeah, Emily. Um, yeah, I'll just do this as a quick final thought. Um, I wasn't sure at the very beginning whether we were going to be in a comedy or a tragedy, a drama, what, what sort of we were in. Um, and to me, this feels mostly like grounded farce is the only way I would put it. Um, and uh, sort of on the question of, okay, what's going to happen next? One of the things that I'm really loving is not only that the plot is moving at a breakneck, break, break wow, <laughs> speed, um, breakneck, um, <laughs> but that so many of my expectations regarding what happens next in a farce which as you said, usually includes, well, both farce and tragedy would include various forms of gaslighting. Certainly the um, revelation from Bess that she was pulling the trick on um, Roughneck would have gone on longer, wouldn't have been revealed to the very end. And instead I'm seeing a lot of subverted expectations. Um, a trope comes on, we expect um, the braggart, you know, to remain the braggart and the bravo for much longer, that's right. subverted. Um, the breaches trick comes on. We expect that to go through the play. It's subverted. Um, yeah, you know, the opportunity for Spencer to do this, it's subverted, it's subverted, it's subverted. And yet again, continuing in a very believable way. Um, that's that's just lovely. I mean, I think if there's any students of Commedia or of Roman plays out there, um, this would be a fantastic play to take a look at and to see what is the way to both use a trope and then not so much to subvert it as to maybe play with play with the trope and what would be the natural outcome if you didn't do the expected next farcical thing. Yeah, yeah, and also just kind of you get all these things, but now where we've paused, like where we stopped, is actually a really interesting point because we okay we've built all the elements up, so what next? Well, you can find out if you tune in into the next video um so but i don't know any other thoughts since we're wrapping up and stuff um no one seems to be waving drastically at me or saying hey you forgot me so i'll just say thank you to all these wonderful readers and the devil take your ox heels you foul god's head <laughs> <laughs>